It's 7.40 in the AM. I'm doing something different. It's not beer related, it's wine related. I'm going to get some grapes. I'm gonna make a five gallon uh, batch of wine, hopefully a little more. Uh, I'm on my way to actually help harvest uh, with somebody who works at Sarah's work. His name is Jasper. He has his own wine company. Uh, Angelina Wine is the company. He has wines called Rhythm Wines. Really, really good stuff. Uh, so um, I'm driving about a half an hour north of, from Glendale and uh, gonna help him harvest and uh, yeah, get some grapes. All right, that was hot. Labor wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. I thought it'd be like on my hands and knees, but I got hot there. It's about 10.30 a.m. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna uh, crush the wine grapes and uh, start the fermentation. Here they are. Got the grapes. Very excited. So I'm gonna crush these with my feet. I've always wanted to crush grapes with my feet. And today's the day, very excited. I'm going to take as much of these stems out as I can, and I mean as much, I mean like a couple of pounds worth. I have about 100 pounds of grapes in here. So uh, I'm going to separate them a little bit, put them into here, I'm going to crush it into here as much as I can, and then put it back into here. So I figure I can maybe empty out maybe, maybe like half, I'm guessing, into there, or somewhere close. And uh, yeah, I'm putting it back in. So I'm gonna de-stem right now. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I wanna get rid of as much of the greenness as I possibly can. Cause that can raise the pH and it can also uh, cause other tannins and stuff that I might not want. But it kinda is what it is. Most of the grapes are gonna have them anyway. And I'm okay with that. So we'll see how, how, how much, uh, how annoyed I get doing this. It could, I could only do this for like 10 minutes and be like, screw it. The main thing you want to do for wine is, is regulate your pH, ideally around 3.4, 3.7, somewhere in that range. I'm going to do somewhere in that range. You can also do TA, which is titrable acidity. I may have said that wrong. And that has to do with basically an approximation of the total weight of the acidity. So it's like tartaric acid, malic acid, and citric acid. This is as far as I understand it. I'm still trying to learn this stuff a little bit. Uh, so it deals more in weight. So you have like a gram, so like a decent TA range would be like seven grams per liter. And then you measure your wine in bricks, which deals with, uh, you know, the same thing as basically, you know, Play-Doh for beer or gravity for beer. You'll see your bricks reading on refractometers a lot. I'll probably take one just to see where I'm at. I'm not gonna mess with it too much. So I'm gonna focus a lot more on the acidity than on anything else. And I did buy tartaric acid to lower the pH. That's what we use for this because that's largely what the acids are in this. And for the record, uh, I've been doing this for about five minutes now and I've only done two of these. I think I'm gonna leave all the stems on because why not? I've had good wine that I've had the stems left on, you know, for a first batch, who cares? Uh, I just wanna learn, kind of learn what I'm doing here. <laughs> Well, I should say second batch. I did make a wine kit batch. It was horrendous. And uh, this hopefully will be better than that. I imagine it'll be better than that. A lot more control. The grapes are a lot better. I got Tempranillo grapes here. The weird thing about this for me is that I am so not used to not having to sanitize anything. I mean, my hands are just all over this. This is unsanitized. This bucket's unsanitized. I'm gonna stomp it with my feet. And I'm gonna do an actual fermentation on this. So, I'm not going to pitch any yeast. Uh, I won't add yeast nutrient, although I probably should, but it should be fine without doing that. Yeah, I don't, screw it. And for our first batch, let's, let's just see what I get out of it. Although I will probably sanitize after it ferments and I put it into a carboy, uh, but the, you know, for the first initial fermentation, whatever's on the skins is going to ferment this puppy. I love natural wine. It's one of my favorite wines, so that's what I'm targeting here. Um, this is going to take me hours and hours and hours. I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to put it in there, crush it in my feet, put it back in. So yeah, 
pumped. These are really good, by the way. Okay, these are ready to uh, crush. I got them into three different bins here. The issue is I don't really have any like shorts I want to dirty up in case wine splashes on it. Might as well make these into shorts. Now I got shorts. Well, I didn't see anything about rinsing your feet. I feel like just mentally being a home brewer, I should do that. It's probably not needed. I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> it feels so weird. It's so weird. It's really slimy. I don't know how much to crush up in this. I'm just gonna do it until it's like a soupy mess, I guess. I think that's pretty good. All right, I'm gonna call that one there. Next is this one. It's not okay, last one. Okay, there's the last of it. So 20 gallon trash can and I'm like, Three quarters of the way full, it looks like. Yeah, take a look. I'm not gonna take a uh, pH reading on this puppy and see where we're at. It's amazing how pink it is in color. Um, now that's because the skin's turned the wine red and I didn't know that until recently. How embarrassing is that? Here's an example. The inside's white. So you technically can make a white wine with any grape. Uh, I don't know that you would, but you can. It might be harder with the Syrah, which has like a deep red, you know, hue to it on the skin. The, uh, probably the best you get with the Syrah is a Rosé, but this is the part that I was actually the most nervous about. I'm going to add very little bit of tartaric acid as needed and then retest, stir in, retest until I get to where I want to get to because I don't want to overshoot it. So the pH is a little high. This is reading at 3.77 and it's dropping a little. He said the pH should be a little high, the guy I got the grapes from, because Tempranillo tend to be a little bit high on the pH. One gram per liter of wine is roughly what you add for tartaric acid to get the pH to drop by 0.1. I might add that amount. But at the ballpark this, I don't know how many gallons I have here. I think I have maybe, it looks like 10 gallons worth of juice. What I might do just for fun is add a little bit of tartaric acid to this. I mean, just a snippet. What I came up with was that 30 grams or lower by 0.1. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do 10 grams. Stir it in, test it again. And if it doesn't really stabilize or get lower, I might do like 5 or 10 more. But I'm not going to go much more beyond that because I don't know how to raise the pH in wine. I could dilute it down maybe a little bit with water. But I don't know then that would mess up my sugars and I've... <laughs> I'm so new to this with using actual grapes. I don't want to get into that. So I'm going to keep it simple for this one. Add a little tartaric acid. That hopefully gets me to around 3.5, closer to that range. Okay, I got 10 grams of uh, tartaric acid here. Online it said to dissolve in a little bit of wine. I don't know if that meant the must of the wine, the unfermented wine. I don't know. I don't know if I'm, stew I don't know if I'm supposed to do warm water. Let's just see what happens by doing this. Okay, I'm still a little high. I'm at 3.68. I'm at 3.68. So it dropped a little bit. Oh, 3.66. All right, I'm going to add 10 more grams. Take another reading and probably call it there. I will be okay at 3.6. It's definitely within the ballpark of what I'm going for. I'm at 20 grams. And of about 6 to 8 gallons, I'm ballparking probably closer to 8. I'm going to add 10 more grams. 3.56. So that's fine. That's good. Really good. I'm in the ballpark. I ended up adding uh, seven more grams. So that's 32 grams total. I have about, like I'm guessing, between six and eight gallons in here of actual like uh, fermentable liquid. I figured I'd take a Brix reading on this. I'm not going to adjust it though. I'm at 22 and a half. So probably a little, little on the low end, I'd say. I'm going to put the lid on it. I'm going to put it near the AC in uh, our, our living room and uh, let it do its thing. I decided to take another Brix reading for the wine 
It's been hours later. I'm in the middle of a brew day, but I saved some of the uh, must to uh, test later. I just had a feeling 22 bricks wasn't right. So I'm looking at 23.2. So that's a lot better. And that in the beer world is 1098, it looks like. Uh, it's a good starting gravity, I would think. So uh, yeah. It's been three days since I got the wine to the bin. Fermentation has started. What I've been doing over the last three days has been what's called punching down the cap. So all the grapes and all the goop and all that stuff is sitting on top and the wine is sitting on the bottom. And why you want to punch it down is you want to keep it aerated and you also want to keep it uh, uh, wet as well. You don't want that cap to dry out. The bacteria, Acetobacter, uh, can possibly enter in through oxygen at the top that way and mess up your wine and turn it into vinegar. So we don't want that. Also, it's just good to keep the yeast in suspension and flowing around, or the lees as they call it. Okay, I'm gonna let that go for another like three to four days, uh, and then I'll do a uh, gravity reading at that time and see where the bricks is at. All right, taking my first bricks reading here. Uh, it's been almost a week, it actually been exactly six days since I got the grapes and I crushed them. My bricks reading is at 1.03. I started at 23.2 bricks, so that's pretty good. Uh, I think I need to be close to zero. I'm not 100% sure what to do at this stage, but that for those in the beer world, that equals up to a gravity of 1.004. So it dropped way down. Um, I think 1.000 or zero bricks would be ideal, but it's really, really close. Um, it also because it's really thick of particulates and all sorts of crap in here still. So I might just call it here. I might get a second opinion also on what to do at this stage with the guy who I harvested the grapes with. So let's take a sip here. It's really harsh and tannic to me and really boozy tasting, like really boozy tasting. That alcohol plays with those, with the TA and with the bricks and uh, the acidity and all that. It is pretty acidic though. I will give it that. It's not necessarily sweet. It's odd. Now, I don't expect it to be amazing by any means right now because it just finished fermenting or is at the, the tail end of fermenting that seems to age for a while. So we'll see. It's interesting. I never had a wine this young before, uh, right out of the uh, fermenter. So cool. Yeah, happy. Um, and uh, yeah, let's get to the, to, to the pressing, whether it be tomorrow or five days from now. You, you guys will know the difference. All right, it's wine pressing time. I rented a wine press for the homebrew shop. I did some research online, watched some YouTube videos on how to do this. Seems pretty straightforward. You put all your uh, grapes into there and you let it drain out and you get what's called your free runnings and it just runs out. And then when that is pretty much done, you're left with all the grape solids and then you press that down and get a second running essentially. And uh, yeah, and some people ferment that separately and you com can combine them. I'm just gonna do it all in one because I don't really care. I just have to make sure that the second runnings and the pressings, I don't get too much tannins because that can uh, hard, you know, mess up your wine later. So uh, yeah, let's get started. I did sanitize some of this stuff. I don't know if it's even necessary. Couldn't hurt, right? So I got a six gallon carboy, and then I also got a three gallon carboy at the ready. So I'm figuring I'll get about nine gallons out of this, eight gallons. And I do have a one gallon carboy also, or a one gallon jug, I should say, just in case. So if I do have 10 gallons in here, which I doubt, uh, I do have that too. I did see somewhere that said to get as much of the liquid as you can um, off your first runnings in there right? and trying to leave as much of the grape stuff behind or the must I should say. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to get in there and just pour it in. Again, I don't even, I don't need, I don't think I need to even sanitize anything. It's going in this dirty old wooden press here. I don't know. I don't know. It's just the home brewer, the home brewer in me with beer can't help myself. All right, it's going. All right, I'm about halfway full on this. As you can tell here, there's still quite a bit left. Looks like I'm about halfway or so. Someone said that this wasn't that messy of a process. It's pretty messy. I'll switch this out. Oh, that's heavy. All right. Woo. It's a workout somewhat. It's also hot in here. You got this contraption. These old things go in here 
and you like do like a click thing and it ends up pressing it all down. So as you can see here, it's about three quarters of the way full with all my grape must. And then you stack the blocks on top. Okay, so as I do this, these things click down like this, which opens this one up as I press it and this turns very slowly and presses all this down. You can kind of see it being squeezed down here. And that's how the mechanism works there. I did see something online that said, uh, you know, you don't want to go above a certain PSI of pressure in here. Like I said earlier, you don't want to extract too much tannins. Uh, I might be at the, at the breaking point of how much to press out of this. So I think I'm good with what I have. And uh, yeah, call it there. It looks like I got about seven to eight and a half gallons, somewhere in that range. It's great. What I'm probably going to do, because I want to top these off when I age them, so what I'm going to do now is let these sit for 48 hours, let all the crap and all the stuff and all the other particulates flocculate out, siphon it back into the trash can, clean these out, siphon it back into the, these vessels, and then uh, let's do their, their next step, which is going to be the, uh, to be the malolactic fermentation. And the malolactic fermentation is where the uh, bacteria takes malic acid and converts it into lactic acid. And through that, you can get byproducts of like butter, buttery scotch stuff, diacetyl. Uh, but in red wine, it's pretty common. I mean, most people do it. You can also not do it. You can also stop it from happening. I'm not sure how to do that. But um, I think you can get a nice sort of soft lactic acid sortedness to it. So I think it's a good thing to do. I'm going to do it with these. And uh, I think that'll happen in the next month or two is my guess. Just finished pressing. Take my gravity reading here. I just pulled off some of the runnings from it as it was going. And I am at zero bricks. Pumped about that. I was a little concerned that it wouldn't uh, get down to zero, but you know, letting it sit for another day or two was perfect. Um, yeah, on to the next step. Probably can't see it as well from there, but there's a little bit of uh, like a good inch and a half or inch or so layer. And yeah, so from here on out, I'm gonna be kind of mindful of sanitation. It's not as vital still as I, as I probably think it can be for beer. But I did read that star sand is a good thing to use uh, from here on out and for, you know, basically as much of it as you can as far as from what I gathered and mentally. So, yeah, transferring to this. And then I have my, my second pressing here. Right there. I'm going to mix those two into there. Then transfer this into six gallons. So it's all the way to the top. And have two one-gallon jugs and fill those to the top as well. We'll see if I have any left over. I probably will. I don't know what to do with that yet. Because as far as I understand it, you need to keep oxygen out as much as possible from here on out. In fact, I'm probably going to purge this into jugs of CO2. Alright. Everything's transferred into here. I'm going to give it a quick stir with a spoon. Make sure everything's in there. Mixed up well. I don't want to get too much oxygen into this right now. I just want to stir everything in. Make sure it's mixed well. I'm sure it is, but... Better be safe than sorry. Okay, so the first and second runnings are now combined. I'm gonna give this six gallon carboy a purge with CO2, if I can find the tank. I think it's more important to do at the end, like when you top off, just do the headspace with CO2 before you put the, the stopper on, but, or the airlock, I should say. Okay, I think it's pretty good. All right, we're on our way. And I can upright this once it's about halfway fill. Just trying to minimize splashing. All right. So that's awesome. Six gallons are done. I got my other jugs here. I think I have about two gallons left. It's hard to tell. Uh, if I have a little left over, I might play with it. Um, I might put it aside maybe like in a growler, maybe blend it with the beer, uh, maybe age it separately just to see if anything happens with it. So the next step is going to be aging this, and uh, that's kind of cool, so now you just let it sit for a while. I don't know the length yet, I have to ask the guy that who I got the grapes from, what he recommends. Uh, I'll taste it along the way. You also going to need to watch the sulfide levels, that's at least one thing I read. I don't think I'll do with this as much, it's my first time. I might get some insight onto that. 
we'll see if I do that. Like I said earlier, it will go through malolactic fermentation. And it's not really fermentation, but yeah, the bacteria does convert that mild acid into lactic acid. And that will happen at some point in the next month or two is my guess. I actually don't know when. I don't think it doesn't create CO2, so it should be fine just sitting in here. All right, I only get one more gallon out of it. Not a big deal. That was going to get two. I got this little extra. I might save it and play with it. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but this is great. I got, I think I got about seven and a half gallons total out of this because I went to the top off on both of these. Couldn't, can't complain at all. I did notice that in the uh, wine making kit that I did and wine making kit videos I've seen online, people tend to uh, give it a stir about halfway through their aging or maybe like maybe like a month or two into it. And there's a lot of like CO2 build up in there and it gets volatized out. I've seen it, you can put it on a drill and it spins and gets rid of the CO2. And the wine pamphlet that I read, I didn't see anything about that. Granted, I stopped reading pretty much after this point. I scanned through the end because I figured I had time to catch up on the next wine making steps. But from what I gather, I think you just let it sit. I will also try and keep this at around 70 degrees Fahrenheit or so as best I can. It's still about mid 80s to high 80s here. It's uh, so early September in the world. And I, I just don't have a way to keep this cold right now. I just don't. I can keep it in my apartment, but during the day it gets to the mid 80s anyway. So I'm gonna keep it in the garage. It's supposed to cool down next week to the mid 70s. Hopefully it stays that way. And by October, I wouldn't have an issue at all. And that's the, yeah, that's the end of this video. Uh, I'll do some updates along the way. I probably have to age for about four months to eight months in that range, maybe a year. I don't know. I will not oak it because I don't like oak wine that much. And like I said, I might control some of the sulfates. I might not. Yeah, stay tuned for more videos. Like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, get out there and uh, make some wine and maybe uh, drink some too.